Hello, hello. Welcome to my podcast, From Prison to Promise, with your lovely host, Colleen Manny. Welcome, welcome. Come on in, sit at the table, pull up a chair, let's talk. There's always room for you here. I'm really excited about my guest today. I've known him since I was a kid, Aaron Jabbott, and he has overcome so many, so many obstacles and challenges, and he is a success. So I am just, once again, excited to have him and grateful for his time today. Hi, Aaron. I'm so thankful that you took the time today to come in the podcast and share some of the things that you've been through, you know, and, and just being transparent and authentic. And I really appreciate your time. So if you want to share with everybody, um, maybe I'll introduce yourself, share a little bit about some of the struggles and challenges that you had, you know, with your incarcerations, and then we'll we'll go from there. Hi, my name is Aaron Jabbett. Uh, I'm from West Lawrence Falls, New York. Uh, I started at a very young age getting into trouble. Uh, my father and my mother went through a divorce, and my little brother passed away. It was very hard on us. Uh, my dad had to work late at night. So I was in the streets at a very young age. Uh, he left my sister home to watch us, but... We never paid no attention. We just ran out the door and did whatever we wanted to do anyways. I started selling drugs around 14, 15, and my first drug sale was when I was 16. Yeah, I, you know, I remember how the Mannies and the Jabbits were, were well known for being rough and tough, you know, and I, I remember you as, you know, as a kid. You know, and people would always say, oh, there, here comes trouble. They would say that about us, Mannies and Jabbits. So, um, you know, so you, you were, I think if I remember correct, you were 16 the first time you ever actually got arrested. Is that correct? Correct. I was 16 years old when I first got arrested. Uh, I went to jail. I got bailed out. And why I was out. You think I would have learned, but I was still being a knucklehead. Uh, I got involved in a bad car accident. The car was stolen. Uh, I broke and shattered my whole left leg, femur and bone. We're in a high-speed chase with uh, Lens Falls PD. And uh, the judge, he got sick of hearing my name, so he revoked my bail, put me back in jail. And the uh, only offer they would give me is 4 to 12 years in state prison. Wow. I had to accept it. So at 16, you went to state prison at 16 years old. The only thing I could think to the ask you, think. at 16 years old, do you think if you would have had, if they would have set up some kind of mentorship program besides being on probation, do you think that would have made any kind of difference for you at the time? Or were you still just, um, because you sounds like you had really no guidance. You were, you know, you were able to run the streets and all that. But do you think a mentorship might have helped you um, not go to prison at 16 years old? I do believe it would have helped. I believe that they had more programs in the jail and out there for people. Because remind you, I was 16 and selling drugs, but I still already had a drug addiction at that young of age. I was already doing drugs. <clears throat> so there was uh, no programs really in the area like that for, you know, drug addicts or they automatically just thought I was a drug dealer and they didn't really care to even look at the problem of what I was into. They just wanted, to, they were sick of hearing my name and they're like, you're going to jail. So yes, it would have been beneficial if I did have better guidance or someone to help me. My dad did love me, but he had to work. He was the only one working. He wouldn't accept social services. He wouldn't accept food stamps at the time. And uh, he just left us, you know, to run the roads. So take me to what being 16, going to um, downstate to prison at 16 years old. What did you do? Like, did they push, did they force you to go to finish school? Did you get your GED? Did you, did they make you work? Like, what was it that you, you did for the, how, and how long did you stay? Um, in your bid, your first bid? My first bid 
was the four to 12 years. I went to actually, we went to Clinton Correctional Facility to get your head shaved. We got our DIN number. Uh, then from there, we had to go all the way to downstate. Then from downstate, you have to do certain testing to see where they're going to put you. They put me in a place called Green Correctional Facility. And Green Correctional Facility is like an adolescent facility. But back then, they mixed the adults with the adolescents. So it was it was very rough. Uh, Why I was there, they did have programs, but they weren't forced to go. Uh, you could go, but if you're th – there wasn't enough structure to learn anything. So um, when I was there, I got into a fight, got 200 days in a box, wow. uh, solitary confinement. Went to Mid-State S Block. Then from the S Block, I went right to Clinton Denimora. From Clinton Denimora, I did a couple of years there. Got shipped to work release. Took all my behavior that I learned in prison. Because the only thing I, when I went to prison, I got a degree just to be a better criminal. Uh, so I, <laughs> I took that out in society with me. And uh, I started getting in more trouble. Then... Before you know it, I had a whole new felony. So it sounds like to me that you were let down time and time again. You know, of course, the system failed up, failed us. Um, do you think that your anger grew all through those years because you had to learn to be tough and you had to you had to get that outward toughness? Did that um, change you as a person? Like you were saying, like, did it make you more like not trusting people? more like, you know, rebelling against authority so that you came home with a chip on your shoulder, anger and more rebellion towards authority. Would you say that's fair to say? Absolutely. Uh, when I came home, uh, I wasn't even the same person. I learned so much in jail and prison. Uh, only thing I took home was a bad attitude. And I put law enforcement and judges, I put them in a category. I was like, that's them. And this is us, you know, we're, we're, we're gangsters and we're living outlaw lifestyles. And, uh, that's just what it turned to be. There was like no talking to the cops, uh, no networking, nothing like it was just straight crimes. If you get pulled over, don't say nothing. Don't talk to them. They're your enemy. So then, so you said you got another felony. Did you go, uh, what was your second bid? My second bid was for robbing a drug dealer. Wow. Uh, I got three years with five years post supervision. And I, uh, I was accused of going in a motel room and hitting a drug dealer in the head with a wrench, taking all of his drugs and leaving with it. And uh, there, I had a couple of co-defendants that were with me. And uh, they gave all the co-defendants a plea deal to testify against me because, like you said, the Manny and the Javit name uh, were like public enemy number one. They just wanted me in jail. They didn't care about helping me, nothing about rehabilitation. So they all got a plea deal to testify. But at, at the end, I did get three years, five years post-supervision, but I was taken it to trial. So at the end of the trial, I was still entered a plea bargain. They still gave me a chance. So I took the three years. Uh, flat with five years post, went to prison, got out, didn't learn nothing whatsoever, uh, and back in the streets, back in the streets, committing, you know, getting, I was a little bit better when I got, cause I wasn't going to get in no more trouble, but I still ended up in a bar room, got into a bar room fight, caught another felony, then went to jail for that felony. That was an assault in a bar room. Then from there, I got arrested in jail for fighting with my lawyer. Then during trial, I got into a fight with a lawyer that was representing me, but he didn't file charges on me. Yeah, I remember reading that in the paper. So was it just all your anger and you felt like you were just being sold down the river constantly? Is that what like brought you to the boiling point to where you lashed out at your attorney? There was multiple things. My dad stopped talking to me for a while because of my behavior. Uh, he didn't want he didn't want to talk to me anymore. He was showing me tough love because he used to send me packages the first prison bid. Uh, he would send me money, and uh, I wore out my welcome very fast. 
He's like, I don't know what happened to my son. You go in there as a kid, you come out as a monster, you know? And uh, so with all that, with my dad not talking to me and just being back in jail, I was definitely broken inside. I had a lot of shame that I was dealing with, uh, a lot of guilt, and uh, I was miserable. And uh, I was just very angry, taking out my frustrations on people who didn't deserve it. So how much time did you get for this charge? And so was this your final bid and how long was it? My final, my final bid with the one charge with the lawyer and the assault charges got ran all together. They gave me six years straight with five years post supervision. That whole six years I did, I did in solitary confinement. I was still getting in trouble. Uh, but while I was in solitary confinement and that lawyer who didn't file charges against me, uh, and he showed me empathy. And I used to think about that uh, quite a bit when I'd be in my cell. And uh, that's what had me looking at law enforcement lawyers in a whole different way. Because remind you, he was a court appointed lawyer. I didn't pay for him. And I was like, he could have put me in jail for the rest of my life. If he would have charged me, I wouldn't have never got out. He got me a good plea offer and uh, I was very thankful and very grateful. And uh, while I was in solitary confinement, I uh, started reading a lot of literature about Christianity, different religions. I came across uh, a couple books and a couple papers I got from the chaplain about Martin Luther and I started reading about it, and I really got into the Lutheran faith. And uh, I started reading about the good thief. Mm -hmm. And he's also known to Catholics and other Christ Christians as St. Dismas. Uh, that's when my whole life truly completely changed around. Uh, when I realized that church wasn't for elite people, uh, Christianity wasn't for elite people. When Jesus, when the thief asked Jesus, please remember me when you entered your kingdom, he was forgiven that day. And uh, I, when I, when I read that, I was like, well, I have a chance. You know, this guy was being crucified. He must have did something really heinous to be crucified at that time. And if Jesus has taken him to heaven, he was the first person in heaven with Jesus was a criminal. And uh, that completely changed my life and the way I looked at everything. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that you spent six years in solitary confinement. But finding out like that you met, you know, the Lord in that solitary place, you know, it's and then the hearing the story, you know, um, about the good thief. That is really the epitome of the faith, like the worst of the worst. He finds us. He loves us. He forgives us. He, You know, we have a clean slate. The freedom you must have felt, even though you were in the most secluded place, you know, in the solitary confinement, that can play tricks on a lot of people's minds. And, and there's been a lot of studies, you know, I don't want to go off on tangent, but there's been a lot of studies of the damage that um, solitary confinement does uh, on humans because we're, we're meant to live in relationship. We're not meant to live um, alone like that. You know, um, you were literally a miracle. You really are. And that he found you there. He met you there in your lowest spot and, 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 and touched your life. And so, you know, just, I just wanted to say that, like, I hope you realize um, just really, you could have been like myself, just another statistic that never made it out, that never broke the cycle, that, that um, just continued to do the, you know, life on the installment plan in the prison system, you know, oh, you'll be back. You've, you know, no, yeah, we'll be back to share the good news. That's what I, that's what I used to say to them. We'll be, I'll be back to share the good news. And that's what you're doing right now. Um, so. When you, you had this transformation in, in solitary confinement, now just take me to when you, that after that time when you got out, what was different for you this time? Everything was different. My, my, my whole mindset, I was like, I'll never commit a crime again. I'm never going to get in trouble again. And while I was in solitary confinement, I used to pray all the time. You know, a lot of my prayers, please let me, you know, have a, a a better relationship with my father, reunite us, and uh, everything I prayed for, 
it, it came true. Before my dad passed away, I got to, you know, be on his deathbed with him and say goodbye to him. Uh, I was very grateful for God to give me that experience and that time with my father because uh, you, you never know what you have until it's gone. And when you, I would have to live with more guilt than I do have to live with now. And I, and I'm glad that God gave me that, that chance to get his forgiveness from my, you know, from my father. Uh, but as soon as I got out, people, places and things, I, I was, I went right to church. I got an address from a church from the pastor in Clinton. I started setting up appointments, calling the pastor, and uh, and 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 I'm going today. I, I still go tomorrow morning. I'll be going to church, and I've been out since 2019. And uh, it was hard going to church at first because there's still you know judgmental people that even go to church. But you got to overlook that. You got to just there are people out there that will help you, and uh, that's another hard thing about reentering when you're getting out of prison about reentry. It's hard to get, you know, certain help with jobs, you know, people trying to get you in the right place, finding an apartment. It's even hard to find an apartment because you get denied for a lot of things when they do a background check. But, uh, yeah, and I'm still going today. You know, I don't get no trouble and I'm out of trouble. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad that you brought that up about, you know, getting out and then, you know, having that stigma you know, having that stigma, having all the felonies, people, you know, the the living situation of getting an apartment and the background to check. And then, you know, even in jobs, that's, that's all real talk right there. That's real talk, the challenges. But you had the Lord on your side, it sounds like to me, right? That you had the Lord on your side. So this time you were doing it different because you were not alone. You're doing it through him. You were, and he helped to break down the, the stigma within you so that you could go there with confidence, knowing like that you're a new person, you're a new creation, that you're forgiven. And then did that empower you um, to just not give up at all the obstacles, all the challenges? Does that give you, is that what gave you the, that fight in the good way now? Um, would you say it was the Lord? And then uh, also go into sharing what you, what you, how you wrote a book and how you started your own business now. So share, is that what sure. really got you to where you are now? Is that shift, the internal shift, knowing that you're not alone, that God, the, God is within you and walking with you? Absolutely. Uh, with prayer and, and with God's help, I wouldn't have been able to do this without God's help. I thank God every day. Even the book that I wrote, I dedicated to God. I said, uh, with, with whom without, or I don't know how I said it. I don't have the book here. I forgot it, but uh, I made it very clear. I'd still be a knucklehead if I didn't have God in my corner. Uh, every day, you know, I, I pray to God and I'm very grateful. Uh, one thing solitary confinement did uh, make me aware of to enjoy and appreciate the simple things in life. Uh, you know, little things make me happy. I wake up and my wife's like, why are you so happy every morning? I said, you have no idea. I can get up. I can eat whatever I want to eat. I can snack whatever I want to snack. And uh, I started my own cleaning business. Since I've been out, it's going okay. Uh, and and I just keep focusing forward. And, and every, you know, I, I still think we need more programs out here, though, for people that are re entering back in the community. I think more spiritual programs. Uh, and, and I think the story about the good thief, you know, it, it would help people to hear that more. I think a lot of times that story is not talked about enough in the Bible. You hear a lot of stories, you know, verses, but I think people like us can identify to the good thief because all the guilt, the shame that we lived in, we didn't think there was no hope for us. At one time in my life, I didn't think there was no hope. Not Once a gangster, always a gangster, and that's not the case. God has unconditional love for all of us. No, I'm so glad that you said that. And now I'm like, <clears throat> we're like the gangster for Jesus now. So like I went hard for the bad. Now I'm going hard for the good. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up about the gratitude that you have. Whenever I find myself um, getting ungrateful or just getting like wanting to complain, I have this little thing that I do. I used to get, you know, the Bustella. They were like the golden bricks to get into coffee in prison. Okay. I go to the store. I buy one of them. I literally buy a nylon. 
and I make my coffee like I did in prison and I remind myself how far God brought me and it puts me right back into that gratitude. You know, I start my day on praying and then I do like my daily, I spend my time with my devotionals and my reading and I put him first. Is there any, any spiritual practices that you did that you found when, you know, in solitary confinement that you still do that is, um, you know, that helps you in every, every day? life for me prayer is the most important thing for me uh because i know prayer works and uh all my prayers were answered by god and uh and they're still being answered you know sometimes it might take a little bit of time and it might not just be the way you want it but uh god has god has weird ways of doing things sometimes but uh they tend to, you know, work its way out. We all struggle. We all have trials and tribulations. It's the way we deal with it. But prayer for me and giving it all to God, it, it, that's that's what keeps me going is prayer. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that. And we can do that all throughout the day. You know, when I'm working too, I'll lift up, you know, I'll be in constant communication with with him. And it's a, it's a whole new way of life. Um just thinking about how you said God works, you know, in weird, mysterious ways. Did you ever think that you and I would be doing this today? Like it's only the grace of God that you and I are here today to share our story, to empower others, you know, that are in the same situation, you know, um, to any family members or, you know, or somebody maybe going head into jail that may listen to this podcast, what words, what words of advice do you think you would give them um, in their journey or to, you know, to the family members? You know, if you want to address them, people first, and then the ones that are in the mess, in the in their addiction, in in the rebellion. Is there anything that you would? What would you really want to say to them? What message would you want to share with them? First of all, I I cannot believe that you know we're on this podcast together because last time we were anywhere, we were in downtown Albany at a crack house and uh it wasn't it wasn't pleasant uh but my advice you know to people out there that are running the streets getting high it's not worth it you know it, it's just not worth it it's a waste of time uh your 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 value is worth more than that your value is worth so much more than that and for the drugs it's it's you, you got to let it go and, and give it to God. Uh, it was a hard for me, especially, you know, with the cocaine addiction and the cocaine abuse. But uh, I just I, I like to have a, a nice shirt, new clothes. Uh, I, I just. It's just a waste of money. It's a waste of money. And, and it's the devil. It, it tears your soul down. It rips you apart. And. Uh, you know, if anybody hears this podcast that are struggling, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm more, you know, more and free to network. I, I'm, you know, a lot of people said they're always busy. I'm a guy like I always find time and I'll make time for somebody who's struggling, uh, who's going through a hard time. And uh, you can message me, you know, send me a message or whatever, and I'll get back to you. And because I've been there, I was in and out of prison for 25 years. Did six years straight in solitary confinement. I understand the system inside now, and uh, I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And uh, when you give your life to Jesus, it's it's the best feeling in the world. Yeah, come on, bro. That's what I'm talking about right there. Like it, it, it's just so good over here. Like it's just so good. I tell people, I'm like, I literally love being sober, but even more, like you know, walking with the Lord. I, you know, people say, oh, you, your life must be boring now. Absolutely not. It's never a dull moment. You know, like you just said, like I'm, I make myself available. I could be going to the store and I'll get a, you know, a text or a call, like you just said. And I always take the time because I remember like how important that could just be that one word that you say to somebody that says, you know what? I don't know how many times people are like, can you help me get to detox? You want, can you help me get to rehab? Absolutely. You know, let's, let's, we'll do it right now. And the other thing I learned was never wait like you were just saying take that moment right then because that's the moment that they want it want that change get them you know get them into detox get them into rehab but more importantly i always tell them you really want to get free 
you know, you know, I, I always share, you know, about Jesus and how he set, you know, he set me free. He sets you free. Like we're both miracles. And so, you know, what would you, I, I'm, you know, I'm in the process. I founded a, you know, nonprofit change by Christ, which is a reentry service. And eventually I'd love to expand down, you know, into the Warren County, Washington County, because there's nothing for reentry services there either. Um, and you had mentioned about the spirituality, spiritual advisors, you know, going into the jails, going, you know, getting into the prisons. What, what else is a, um, would you like to see change in your area? What, what, what other programs can you envision that would be, you know, helpful for somebody that when they get out and they're on parole? So, like a job fair. For people with felonies, people are getting out of prison. Someone where people could help them get clothes for good interviews, help them look presentable. Uh, right now, we, you know, we go to DSS, and if they have anything on the rack that will fit you, it might definitely might not look the greatest. And uh, I, I think we they should have more work clothes and uh, Things in that nature, you know, shampoo, soap to get people ready to go in the workforce. Uh, sorry about that. My phone seems like it's uh, dying down. Okay, I'll let, uh, you, fix again, I'll let you fix it. I truly, um, apo uh, I truly apologize. It's, uh, it's, it's hap it happens. And that, that, that would be one of the things the most I would like to see. And... I spoke to some people that work in law enforcement and uh, actually I spoke to the sheriff and he was talking about maybe even seeing if uh, the Salvation Army would even allow me to have like a little class in there to talk to guys when they get out to steer them in the right direction because you don't have no one to talk to. This is a very rural area and it would be a great thing for, you know, if someone wanted to pick up the phone and they're stressed out and they're like, Hey, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn to because when your backup is against the wall and you don't have no money, it's easy to get caught up with uh, stupidity. And you know that that drug dealer is just waiting on that corner, waiting for you to come and see him. He's, he's got everything you need and he'll give you the free package. He'll even give you a free package just to get you right back into it. He's, the first one's on me. Don't worry about it. I'm glad to see you're home and you're coming back to work for me. And uh, we need to stop that cycle. It's just a shame to see, you know, people that I grew up with, the 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 toughness from the drugs that is done on them. It, it's very hard to see that when you know it, it's 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 definitely not a good thing. And it'd be great. I'm hoping that the sheriff does find a way to uh, maybe get me into uh, this place and help these guys out and get into a better situation. Well, see, you didn't even know, but uh, Change by Christ, one of the things that we did, the board, you know, and I, my partners and I, the team, we, that is one of the things on our, we have a wish list. And so when they come to us, right, getting out of jail or prison, they come to us, that's one of the things that we do. We get them a nice outfit for the interview. This, this is where when people's donations will go, we can, we're going to show them that it's actually making a difference. Like, I'm so glad that you said that it wasn't even planned. Right. But that's one of the things that I had brought up. Like you just said, they come home with no clothes. They can't go to a job because there are always, you always hear from people. Well, why don't they just get a job? They're losers and all that stigma. First of all, can you imagine going to a job in your state parole clothes because a lot of the people let's face it they are coming home with the state the, the way that the state dressed them from the, the to parole the khaki pants and the white shirt and those little like chimsy white sneakers um so what we want to do is help them to dress for success and then also work on them internally like you're saying you know the ones that are open to lead, leading them to the lord and the other ones that are not will plant the seeds but either way it's to empower them that they can make a change in their life and they can lead, they can go down a different pathway. And part of it, you know, we know that employment and education reduces recidivism and then getting them plugged into community. If, you know, um, with churches and stuff and helping them and, and just, there's so many things. And in you, the key is like you just said, having somebody that's been through it, that's been successful to talk to them. They're going to listen to you and I more than they're going to listen to anybody because we've lived it. We know how they feel. So we have the compassion, the empathy, but then the same token, 
we can empower them to say, look at, not like, oh, look at us. No, look at what the Lord's done in our life and they'll want what we got. And then we can guide them and mentor them. And so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely seeing like, you know, maybe we can, you know, eventually like work together in that and and that, because that's what we, we both have that vision to, to help other people. Cause that's what the, that's what Jesus wants us to do. So, you know, with that, with the, with wrapping it up here, you know, I, um, you know, I do in a lot of reflection and listening to what, everything that you had to say, you know, um, what, like, first of all, with your family. Okay. This is one other thing I want to touch on with your family. You got married to a wonderful wife. You know, did you, how long was it? Cause this is another thing that's just coming up real quick. This is a short note. How long did you wait till you got into a relationship and got married when you first got home? Well, we started off as friends. I know her brother and uh, we started off as friends. We did, we took it very, very slow. Uh, I did get a, I got married like a year later. Uh, and we're best friends. You know, I, I, I knew her family. Uh, it, it, it worked out and I understand it's not good to get right into a relationship as soon as you get out of prison. Uh, right. my father was dying. Uh, she was helping me with rides. That's how we started talking and going back and forth. We spent a lot of hours together and, uh, we fell in love. She's my best friend. She's my soulmate. And uh, our anniversary is coming up on Monday. That yes. Happy yes. anniversary. So I'm, I, I just wanted to, you know, wrap it up with that, that what you just said is getting, taking the time to get to know people and all of our relationships, whether it be our family and then a possible, you know, person that you want to, you know, marry. It's not rushing in because where we come from, we're so used to having the instant gratification and you, you know, again, like you're blessed. You have a beautiful wife that's your best friend, but you, you know, you took the time to get to know who you were, know, you know, by knowing the Lord and then finding, you know, somebody that got to know you first before you just jumped in. And, you know, um, I just want to thank you so much for your time today and, sh you know, sharing some really personal stuff and just again, to say, thank you. You are a walking miracle. And what was the name of your book so that people can, you know, buy it? Because it's another testimony of, you know, how the Lord changed your life. What's the name of your book? Find it at uh, blur, blurb.com. And it's called From Prison Cell to Church Pew by Aaron Javitt. <laughs> That's so awesome. I love the name of that. <laughs> Well, I thank you again for your time. And if anyone, you know, got anything out of this or, you know, somebody that needs to hear it, make sure that you like, share and subscribe if you want to. It's every two weeks, every Monday, every two weeks on a Monday at 6 p.m. is when the podcast goes off. And I thank you all for your time. And I really look forward to maybe I'll have you on again in the future and you can tell us how successful you are. Thank you so much, Aaron. Bless you. Bless your family. Thank you again for your time. And uh Thank you to all the listeners. All the listeners. Like, share, and subscribe. Get the word out. Let, word let out. other people know that they can change, that somebody can spend that much time in prison in and out and have a change in their life because of Jesus. So make sure you share it with somebody that really needs to hear this. Thank you all for listening and to the podcast from Prison to Promise.